Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating, and marrying, and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore stay away, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed away and would not have left his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The word of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let's pray. Lord, as we spend time in your word now, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to be present with us. We pray that wherever we may find ourselves on our spiritual journeys today, you would reveal to us the timeless truths that are contained within these scriptures we just heard. And we pray, Lord, that you would make us restless until we find our rest in you and you alone. This we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The word Advent comes from Latin. You're going to get a little linguistic lesson here. For Adventist, which basically means coming or arrival. And it's during the first four weeks of the Christian calendar that people of walk, all walks, sizes, and shapes, and backgrounds gather together to pause and reflect upon the arrival of God into the world in the person of Jesus Christ. But Advent also presents us with an interesting opportunity, and that is to reflect upon the great future day when Jesus promises to come once again and return and make everything right in the world. And that is what today's scripture would have us do. Personally, I found it a little bit surprising that during the Christmas or the Advent season, as we're looking forward to Christmas, we would find a scripture that deals with kind of the end times and, and the last days. It doesn't have any of the traditional Christmas elements present that we know and love. Instead, today's scripture reading places us in the middle of a discussion about the end times, the last days, and the need for God's people to be ready. And as I reflected upon it, I realized that this is a brilliant way for us to enter into the Advent season. What better way is there to place ourselves in a situation where we anticipate the future coming of Christ than to do that in a matter that all of us can relate to today? What we find in today's story is an implicit sense of longing, a heartfelt yearning, if you will, for someone or something to come and make everything right in the world. That kind of longing, that kind of anticipation is what Advent is all about. However, we live in, in, in a very great part of the history of the universe because we know that Jesus Christ has already come and entered into the world. We know that the one who is going to make everything right in the world eventually has already started that process through his life, death, and resurrection. At the same time, we get to look forward to a future day when that work that he started will one day be completed. And we know that 2,000 years ago that process began. But prior to Jesus Christ, the Jewish prophets of old looked forward to this day when the Messiah would come and make things right in the world. We have a great song that our musicians are going to play for you in a moment. It's called Hallelujah, and it helps us to grasp the kind of anxiety and angst that I think the Old Testament prophets felt and experienced. In fact, I think the whole world experienced this in the world prior to the advent of Jesus Christ. This song was written by Leonard Cohen back in 1984, and I was surprised to find out that it has become one of the most recorded songs of, of all time. There are over 300 professional recordings that have been made of this song and released commercially. It's, it's amazing. You've heard it in commercials, you've seen it in movies and films. It's, it's a great song. Cohen himself is a brilliant songwriter. He frequently includes themes of sin and redemption in his songs. He does this as a, a Jewish person who doesn't see Jesus Christ as the ultimate fulfillment of God's redemptive plan and process. So when you listen to this song, it's really easy to identify with, with the desire that Cohen has 
to, to see something better in the world, to his portrait that everything right now is not as it should be. But at the same time, you can identify with the prophets of old in his songs because they're looking forward to this day when God would come and make things right, but they don't realize that that has happened already in the person of Jesus Christ. So I think what the song does is portrays a great sense of Advent, a great sense of longing, of anticipation, a longing that cries out for everything to be made well in the world. A longing that wants to worship God but has a hard time doing it because as you try and worship God, the hallelujahs that come out of your mouth seem cold and broken. So with that as an introduction to kind of really put a, a human face on this, let's listen to the musicians performing their version of this song now. And as they do that, let's see if we can find hope for our cold and broken hallelujahs. Like this 
Uh, as is always the case, um, I take your text message questions immediately after the message. So through the course of the, uh, the sermon, you feel like there's something you want a little more clarification on or you have a question about, feel free to either send me a text message question. My number's there in your bulletin. Or you can just raise your hand afterwards. We can have a little bit of a discussion about it. And pretty much anything goes during this, uh, this time. Well, as I said, today's story contains the final message that he, Jesus gives to his followers. This is uh, an interesting place for it during the season of the Advent. It's the final message he gives before his arrest, his crucifixion, and his ultimate uh, resurrection and victory. It's recorded in both Matthew and Mark's Gospels. And in this particular passage, Jesus uses what we call apocalyptic language to describe this great future day when he will return and make everything right in the world. The word apocalyptic just means an unveiling or a revealing or a revelation. That's uh, all that the word means. It usually symbolically paints a picture of highly emotional contexts that help to review, reveal what a future reality would look like in, in a poetic kind of manner. That's very typical for apocalyptic literature and language. And as such, it can often be very confusing, especially for people who aren't used to reading apocalyptic literature. People like us, for example, it's not something that we you know, read every single day or every, every hour. God bless you. What happens when we do this is we accidentally will interpret symbols in a way that they weren't originally intended, and uh, we often find that we're clueless to the meaning of symbols, things like this great flood, or people instantly vanishing, or a thief in the night. Elsewhere in this, in this story, he uses the language of darkness falling and stars falling out of the sky and things like that. It's just not language that we're used to dealing with and interacting with, and often we can misapply what the true meaning and true intention is behind this. I'll give an example of this from pop culture. One of my favorite movies growing up was Ghostbusters. There's a scene near the end of the movie where they're in a courtroom, and they're talking about uh, what's happening as, as it looks like the world is falling apart all around them. And uh, Bill Murray's character in the film tells the mayor that if they don't do something fast, they're about to experience um, a, a vast catastrophe of biblical proportions. That's the phrase that he uses. And the mayor says, well, what do you mean, biblical? And then uh, one character chimes in and, and says, uh, Old Testament stuff, Mr. Mayor, you know, fire and brimstone, uh, rivers and seas boiling. And then another Ghostbuster says, uh, 40 years of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes. You know, really getting into it. And another stands up in preacher-like style, and he says, The dead rising up from the grave! And he starts jumping around. And then Bill Murray jumps in and he says, Human sacrifices, dogs and cats, living together, mass hysteria. Again, it's just a good example of misapplying, I think, this language into actual, literal, physical things that you can see when you're missing out on, on the larger purpose and message behind all of these, uh, the, these topics and these ideas. What happens is, if we, we do that with today's story, we end up losing sight of the clearer, larger picture that Jesus is trying to communicate to his followers, both then and today. And it's a very simple message. It has two parts. The first one is that someday, Jesus Christ will return, and he will make everything right in the world. And the second part of that message is, be ready. It's real simple. Be ready. The first part of the message is very clear in verse 37. He says this, As it were in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now almost every single person who studies these verses knows that when Jesus is, says the Son of Man here, he's talking about himself. It's something his Jewish hearers at the time would have very clearly understood. The Son of Man is a reference to this great, great messianic figure that's mentioned in the book of Daniel. Daniel, who will one day come into the world and make everything right. He will destroy evil and he will set up God's kingdom. That's what the Son of Man will do. There will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more evil, putting into our terms, no more broken relationships, no more, no more cold and broken hallelujahs in our lives because the Son of Man will have arrived. The title, like I said, comes right out of the book of Daniel and it's a reference to Jesus Christ himself as this great person who will return and make everything right in the world. And it's a message of hope as it is revealed to people today just as much as it was a message of hope to people 2,000 years ago when they first heard that Jesus Christ had come into the world. Because the message of Advent isn't just a message about the birth of Jesus Christ. It's a message about what Jesus accomplished for humanity 
on the cross. And it's very important that we remember that. Let, let me give this a human face. Place yourselves for a moment back into the song, Hallelujah, that we just heard. Now imagine this is you saying these words, and it probably won't be too hard for most of us to imagine this. <clears throat> Baby, I've been here before. I know this room. I've walked this floor. I used to live alone before I knew you. I've seen your flag on the marble arch. Love is not a victory march. It's a cold and it's a broken hallelujah. This is a picture of the person who's tried to find solace in relationships. Relationships with other people and relationship with God. But for them, and maybe for all of us, the harsh realities of this world make true love, ultimate love, seem like the stuff of myth and superstition and fantasy. And pursuing it has left them with a cold and broken hallelujah that doesn't bring them any hope and doesn't bring them any comfort. And there's no sense whatsoever that one day things will get better. Telling them the Christmas story might give them some warm fuzzies. It might make them rem remember Christmases long, long ago and good family members, family memories and things like that. But the message of Advent is so much more. And, and if that's all that it is, just about the birth of Jesus and these fuzzies, that's not going to change and transform anyone from the inside out. It won't bring hope to the hopeless. It won't fulfill the deepest needs and desires of someone who longs for something more in life. But the stories that we read in the Gospels about the Advent in Jesus' own life are the stories that transform and change us. What are the Advents in Jesus' own life? Well, he wasn't just born so that we could tell great stories about his birth and about his parents and all that they went through, or so that we could exchange presents. There was an Advent in Jesus' own life, an Advent that led him ultimately to a cross, a place where he suffered a horrible death on our behalf. But this is an Advent that he willingly embarked upon in order that he could make redemption possible for the entire world. In order that he could restore all of us in the midst of our cold and our broken hallelujahs and free us from the self-imposed prisons of sin, misery, and darkness that we find ourselves in. The Apostle Peter was a man who really understood this. This is a man who definitely had a cold and broken hallelujah. This is the man who denied Jesus Christ three times. And yet, eventually, he would write this in 1 Peter 2, 24. He would say this about Jesus. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sin, we could live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Jesus wasn't just some Jewish kid born in a manger. The people of his day and age longed for a Savior who would save them from their sin and from their brokenness and enable them to live for righteousness. They longed for someone who would heal their cold and broken hallelujahs. And Jesus Christ, through his own personal advent, the advent that led him to the cross, did just that. He made that possible for all of us. That's a present reality based upon a past action. But there's also a great future reality here as well. The work of redemption that began with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ will come to fulfillment sometime in the future. Jesus Christ will return again and make everything right in the world. He will complete the task that he started at his birth. This, I think, is one of the best ways to to understand this concept. It's this idea that redemption is already accomplished, but not yet fully accomplished. It's a military illustration. So what comes to mind when I say June 4th, 1944? No, June 6th, 1944. Oh, man. <laughs> Messing with you. Yeah, June 6th, 1944. D-Day, right? Yeah. Yeah, D-Day. This is when the Battle of Normandy began. It's also the turning point in World War II. It's when Scholars and people basically knew that the war had been won after, after D-Day happened. However, the war wasn't officially over yet until V-Day came. V-Day was when they had victory over Japan and, and victory over Germany. V-Day, two separate, separate days. But they looked forward after D-Day to this future day when they knew the war would finally be over. The war was won, but it wasn't over yet. The same thing is true with our redemption. D-Day occurred at the cross. D-Day occurred at the cross and the resurrection. The war was won. 
And yet, it hasn't been completely accomplished yet until Jesus Christ returns again and makes everything right in the world. Now, that doesn't mean that because he has come into the world, everything is going to be immediately fixed and taken care of. It doesn't mean that at all, but we have the hope and the promise that no matter what our present trials, our present struggles, our present difficulties, one day God will make it all right. That is the message of Advent. It's the people during the time of Christ looking forward to a time when Jesus would return and make everything right in their lives. And that began with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It manifests here in the hearts of every single person who cries out in pain and anguish, longing for something better in life, longing for God to come and heal them of their pain, of their cold and broken hallelujahs. It manifests in the hearts of the skeptics as well. The song puts it this way. It says, There was a time when you let me know what's really going on below. I think he's talking about God here. But now you never show it to me, do you? And remember when I moved in you, the holy dove was moving too. And every breath we drew was hallelujah. Maybe that describes you here today. I know it's described to me at times. Perhaps like the Apostle Peter, you need to be reminded that your sin has been forgiven and your brokenness has been healed. Your life has been given new purpose and meaning because of what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. I want to close by looking very briefly at the second part of this apocalyptic message. Be ready. It's real simple. Be ready. What does that mean? Be ready. What does it mean to be ready for this great future day when God will come back and make everything right in this world? Well, I think it means many things. One of the things it means is that we need to be honest about our, our failures and our struggles. Be honest before God and before others about that and allow God to bring healing and allow others to carry that burden for us. That's what a community like this exists for. We're here to carry your burdens, to carry your difficulties and your doubts together. Whatever you're struggling with or dealing with, I guarantee others have dealt with the same thing. Let them carry those burdens for you and with you. It also means we need to be good stewards of the resources that we have, whether it's our time, whether it's our money. What do these things tell others and tell God about your values and what's important to you? Also, I think part of being ready means actively participating in what God will someday accomplish to fulfillment in the future. That means going out and feeding the homeless, taking care of the poor and the needy in our communities. This is where we see the face of Jesus. This is where we get to experience him. And I think that's because it's a little sliver of what he will ultimately come back and bring to completion and to fulfillment. And finally, being ready, I think, being involved, means being involved in a community like this where we regularly get to come to the Lord's table together and partake of these elements together, where Jesus somehow mysteriously is present. We get to have a little sliver, a little slice of this ultimate great feast that we'll be able to experience together for all eternity. We could probably go on and thinking of other ways to be ready as well, but that's probably good enough for this morning. My prayer is that we can continually cultivate and develop a community right here where we can be ready for God's future return, and that can be manifested in our midst by making sure we're caring for the needs of others here and also in the community at large throughout Roseville and the greater Sacramento area. And as we do that, my prayer is that other people will be drawn to him as they see him manifested right here in our midst. It's not because of anything great in and of ourselves, but it's because of the greatness of the one who we serve and worship. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Advent, for your life, death, and resurrection. I pray now that you would send your spirit to empower us to live lives that we were meant to live. And during this Advent season, transform our cold and broken hallelujahs and make us the people in the community that you want us to be. This we pray in the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, let's see if we have any questions here. Good. No text. Any any thoughts or, or reflections? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I forgot my phone. That's okay. Um, the first verse of this passage implies that the sun is not omniscient, at least this, the, the sun at the time he's speaking. Okay, of course, sure. Yeah. It is. It is Human person, so that's that's something I you know wrestle with. Uh, 
because in the end, there's four references total to son in this passage. And the first one just says son, and the other says son of man. So I thought that was interesting. The first one seems to be present time. Is that, is that accurate? I think the so, other yeah. three are afterwards when he is fully uh, in his, his glory, glorified body. So what he's, what he's basically saying is that first verse where Jesus is saying even the Son of Man doesn't know when this future great day is going to be. If Jesus is God and God knows everything, then how do you make sense of that? Because here God is very clearly, Jesus as God is saying, I don't know when this future day is going to be. It's a great question. It's a question that's challenged a lot of people throughout the ages. Um, in the early church, they resolved it in a very simple manner, and it's just the manner that I think I hold to as well, and that's that Christ, as a person, had two different natures. He had one nature that was human, like us, and he had another nature that was divine, that was God. And so, when he's speaking here about not knowing the future hour, Christ, Jesus Christ, the person in his human nature, didn't know when he would return. But in his divine nature, he did know, but that wasn't information that... that um, in his human nature, he was aware of at that particular time or moment. Now, could he have known that if he had asked God or petitioned God? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. That's We don't know because the scripture doesn't tell us, but what we do know is that um, this is a good example of, of showing the Christ, the very humanity of Christ, that there were some things in the mind of God that Jesus, as, as the person, the human side of Jesus, didn't know and didn't grasp. So he's very similar to all of us. So you can almost say that's an Advent scripture for Jesus as well. Jesus in his human nature doesn't know when he's going to come back and make everything right in the world. And I'm sure that's something he wanted to know. I'm sure Jesus looked forward to the day when he would return and make everything right in the world. Just like we see the brokenness in the world, he saw the brokenness in the world as well, and he wanted it to be healed in an ultimate sense as well. So I hope that helps a little bit. Uh, and it's a complicated thing, and you can spend years in seminary studying it and learning it. Ultimately, I think it boils down to, to mystery. There's only so much we can grasp with our human the minds and understandings.